So, what that means is that Father's Day is coming. So that's next Sunday is Father's Day. Our pig roast and axe throwing outside, <laughs> roasting pigs. So it's like, it, it, but I want to make sure you know this. In Psalm chapter 68, it says, God is a father to the fatherless. And if your father wasn't the father that he should have been, then let God be your father. And next Sunday, let's celebrate that. Amen. So uh, come next week, regular service times, 9.45 and 11, slightly, very slightly abbreviated services with a lot of fellowship and fun and connection afterwards. And if you come to the second service, it'll just smell like bacon in here the whole time. So, um, so that's either good or bad, depending, I suppose. The uh, uh, Wednesday nights, uh, we're pivoting on our uh, Wednesday nights right now. We are Wednesday nights is about uh, discipleship, family discipleship. So we have children's programming and youth programming upstairs. We have adult programming downstairs and Right now, we're going through a series on the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's very good, and so I'd encourage you to come on out uh, for that. Uh, last week, we started our Bible engagement goal for the month on uh, what we're encouraging you to do is to watch the Chosen TV series and then connect with what the Bible verses are in that. So you're not passively watching it, you're actively watching it. And so this week, we have season two Bible connections there for you that you can pick up on your way out of the service uh, today. Now, the Bible's basically broken up into two main parts, the first part and the second part, the, the uh, uh, Old Testament and the New Testament, it's commonly called. And in the Old Testament, there are three major types of leaders in this uh, Hebrew Bible. It's the prophets, the priests, and the kings. Three major types of leaders, and so when you're reading through it, you'll see these categories pop up. Then Jesus shows up, and throughout the New Testament, uh, he, we find Jesus fulfilling those roles of the three uh, pr roles of prophet, priest, and king. This particular moment in history, Israel was in trouble, and Jesus had come to save them, to rescue them, and Jesus was now functioning as a prophet, like a prophetic voice to his own people. Okay? Again, he's bouncing between these three roles. And in Matthew chapter 13, verse 47, 51, we find a teaching of Jesus that is one of the more complicated teachings of Jesus you will find anywhere in the New Testament. It says this. Jesus goes, again, the kingdom of heaven. Somebody say kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is talk, trying to explain what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's like a fishing net that was thrown into the water and caught fish of every kind. What kind of fish did it catch? Every kind. When the net was full, they dragged it up onto the shore, sat down, sorted the good fish into the crates, but threw the bad ones away. That is the way it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come and separate the wicked people from the righteous, throwing the wicked into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you understand these things? Yes, they said, we do. So throughout Matthew chapter 13, you have a grouping of several teachings of Jesus. I think there's seven there. And Jesus is using relevant and contemporary metaphors and illustrations, trying to explain as best as he can what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like, what it is like. Now, the spiritual leaders and the people of the day had a very specific type of understanding of what the empire of God would be like, what the kingdom of God would be. Basically, this is what they thought. They thought that basically they were oppressed by the empire of Rome, the ancient Roman Empire, and now these people want to take political control over the empire. That actually sounds familiar to me. They could have, they wanted to do this so they could have their own Jewish empire. Jesus was so popular in this region that they were all hoping that this is the guy that's going to rescue us from Rome. He's going to, they were hoping that Jesus would establish a new empire, a new kingdom that would either overthrow the Roman Empire or somehow remove the Roman Empire from their land. Think of this moment like an ancient political rally. 
an ancient political campaign rally. Except the person that they think is a candidate isn't running for office. So there's a real misunderstanding on the part of the people about what's happening here. So Jesus is very intently trying to explain what his kingdom is and what it's not. And the truth is, the people are having a hard time understanding that their spiritual traditions and understandings do not in fact line up with what Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is like. It's complicated for them to get this. So they've had a certain way of thinking for a long time. And Jesus is disrupting this thinking and saying, I know that's what you think. You're wrong. This is what it's like. Nobody likes to be told they're wrong. And this is what Jesus is doing very sensitively, very carefully, and sometimes very directly. In fact, Jesus teaches with these illustrations in order to call forward those that are finally ready to hear and to understand. Those that were ready could find new life, and those that were not ready would walk away still perplexed, wondering what fish he was talking about. And still there were others that understood what Jesus was saying and rejected it as false or dangerous or impossible. Jesus, again, is functioning like a prophetic voice to his own people, warning them, like a big danger sign. Warning, danger, 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 stop, stop. yield, yield, construction ahead, wrong way, one way, whatever the signs are, Jesus is giving all of these signs to the people. I do wonder sometimes about those signs in Lynn. I wonder, was it really necessary for all of those stop signs to be here? You know, I, I wonder sometimes if we need so many one-way streets or not enough one-way streets. Or it's, it's sometimes it's just, you can tell the city wasn't planned from the beginning. All right? You, you, you get this idea. You got all these signs. But the signs are there for a reason. I hope. But with Jesus... The warning signs are always there for a reason. There's no confusion in Jesus' understanding. Have you ever asked yourself this question? Why does Jesus care if I sin? Maybe Maybe you're more spiritual than me, but I've asked that question. Why does Jesus care if I sin? So what if I'm wicked? What does it matter to Jesus? He's Jesus. Well, the reason it matters is because Jesus loves you and he knows the consequences of what happens outside of his kingdom, both in the present and in the future. He understands what the kingdom of this world leads to. And so he wants us to be part of his kingdom simply because he loves us. In verse 49 we get one of the more challenging teachings of Jesus. That is the way it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come and separate the wicked people from the righteous, throwing the wicked into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the wicked will be judged, which is bad for the wicked, but great for justice. And that's a whole other sermon, the concept of justice and hell and why it's so important. They will be thrown into the fiery furnace. I want you to get this today. Jesus talks about hell more than any other person in the Bible. Why? Because in the kingdom of God, there isn't hell. You don't have hell. Hell only exists for those outside the kingdom. Inside, no problem. Outside, big problem. Jesus is clearly concerned that his people, watch this, he's concerned that his people, the Jewish people, are outside his kingdom. And they need to be rescued. Because many of them are in the wrong kingdom. Now, you have to understand this. This would have been a scandalous accusation. Jesus is speaking to a group of Jewish people saying, you're in the wrong kingdom. Scandalous accusation, but this is an act of love on the part of Jesus. Jesus 
would declare this to people as a warning sign. Hey, I understand. You're my people, but you don't quite get it right on this one. So he's, re- he's helping them to re- truly understand God's perspective of the kingdom of heaven. Now, if somebody were outside tomorrow on the sidewalk passing out pamphlets, warning people about the dangers of, of heroin and fentanyl and, and alcoholism, nobody would think that that person was hateful. They'd be like, oh, that's nice, trying to keep kids off drugs, you know, whatever it is. Or if you were standing down in Louisiana near the edge of an alligator-infested creek, kindly and patiently and graciously letting people know that they will get eaten by alligators and will die a painful and unpleasant death if they decide to go swimming in this creek. Now, nobody would think you are a hateful person. They might think you a little strange, but not hateful. Now, this is really the attitude that Jesus has in his teachings on the kingdom. He is expressing the reality of a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, explaining the dangers of what we understand him to be talking about as hell, and then he's leading people away from it. He's leading them in another direction. Because Jesus is always opposed to people living underneath the dominion and rule of Satan. He will literally, Jesus will literally fight for you until your last breath. Because he doesn't want people to live in earthly or eternal captivity. Now, many people are uncomfortable with this. And they will try to reimagine or or reinvent or dismiss or set aside the eternal realities that Jesus clearly and plainly teaches. They don't want to believe in hell. And honestly, I understand that. It's hard to accept a black and white reality when we live in such a gray world. It's hard to reorient your life and thinking when you have lived underneath the illegitimate rule and control of Satan for your whole life. So changing my life, changing my words, changing my thoughts seems nearly impossible to do. So it is easy to simply accept any other thought that eases the conflict in your mind or spirit about the things, the hard things that Jesus says. But Jesus wants us to think about eternity. He talked about eternity often. In fact, the Bible is very quiet on the subject of hell, except in the words of Jesus. This makes sense, because we would expect that the one who came from eternity would know and talk about eternity more than anybody else. So whenever you are confronted with thoughts that um, are coming from a different place than where Jesus is coming from. I want you to notice the differences between the thoughts of the kingdom of this world and the thoughts of the kingdom of Jesus. Things like, well, you can't ever let yourself be disrespected, but Jesus said, love your enemy and turn the other cheek. Very different thoughts. Very, very, very different thoughts. Or the kingdom of this world might say, whatever works for you, but Jesus said, I'm the only way. So it doesn't matter what works for you, I'm the only way. Very different thoughts. Kingdom of this world, kingdom of God. Jesus said lots of stuff that was very difficult. Um, Sometimes people will come up with these little little booklets, these little pamphlets, like say, like it'll be like encouraging words from Jesus. This passage was left out. Because this is not one of those things that people perceive as encouraging. Like, whoa, that's a hard saying of Jesus. There's other little pamphlets that say hard sayings of Jesus. This is one of them. Well, Jesus said lots of things that are pretty difficult and intentional and over the top to get your attention. For example, in Luke chapter 14, Jesus said something pretty outrageous. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Jesus said that. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. 
That's, that falls under hard stuff Jesus said. Jesus, of course, is speaking hyperbolically when, when he says to hate our parents and family since everywhere else he commands us to love everybody. And to then somehow indiscriminately hate your mother and father would not make any sense. He's going over the top on purpose, declaring to us that no matter what your allegiances are in life, there is no allegiance more important than your allegiance to Jesus. And when we pledge our allegiance to Jesus, we can pledge our complete and total allegiance to Christ first. And we are pledging to follow his example. That's, that's what's going on there. So hard stuff Jesus says. So Jesus said it. We need to pay attention to it, and we need to understand there are different kinds of kingdoms. In verse 47, it says something that to us is not hard. We love this part, or should, uh, but it may not have been super encouraging to the people that heard it. Verse 47 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net that was thrown into the water and caught fish of every kind. You're like, I don't see how that's encouraging. It's because you're the fish of every kind. So this, fit, this net that's being thrown over the boats, there's two boats, okay, floating along, and they throw a net to each other, and one has one side, one has the other, and there's some floaty things on top, and there's some weights on the other end of the net that sink it all the way to the bottom. And then just, they just drag the net across the water and around the, along the bottom, and it catches all kinds of fish. Now, in the Sea of Galilee at the time, there were at least 20 different kinds of fish that were, that were swimming around, and this was actually a pretty easy way to fish, and so they would go, they would catch the fish and bring it to shore. Now, this is really important to understand. The faithful Jews and the cultural Jews were essentially under the impression that because they were God's chosen people, that they were the exclusive owners of God's affection. They had generally forgotten their mandate to be a light to the Gentiles, meaning foreigners and immigrants, to all people that weren't Jewish, all of them. They were chosen by God, and they were. They were chosen by God, not for hoarding privilege, but for distributing God's blessing to the entire world. Isaiah chapter 60 says this, Arise, Jerusalem, let your light shine for all to see, for the glory of the Lord rises to shine on you. Darkness as black as night covers all the nations of the earth, but the glory of the Lord rises and appears over you. All nations will come to your light. Mighty kings will come to see your radiance. Here, we see that Israel was to be the bright hope, the beacon of hope for the world, the city on a hill that would, that would be the standard for life and conduct and, and worship. And they had stumbled along the way. So Jesus, in these teachings, in Matthew 13, Jesus is calling his people back to the reality of his kingdom being for all people. Some might say all. So, so for all people, Jews and Gentiles, them and everyone else. That meant their neighbors to the north that they didn't like, their neighbors to the south that they didn't like, their neighbors to the east that they didn't like, throughout the region and beyond. All of these teachings are happening in the Galilee region, region and near Jesus' adult hometown of Capernaum. Now, Capernaum, oh, watch this. this is, I think this is a fascinating part. Capernaum was on a border, which, a border community which separated the Jews from the Gentiles, people from different ethnicities on one side and then the other, but there was lots of trade going back and forth at the border town. And so you kind of this interesting place where Jesus chose to land. But there's more to it. If you pay attention to the geography and trade routes of the Middle East, you'll see on this map that there's a very interesting road that goes through Capernaum. It's called Via Maris. So on top of that sea, that body of water, the Sea of Galilee, you'll see a community called Capernaum. That red line is an ancient highway, an ancient trade route that goes 
and cuts north right at Capernaum. Why does that matter? This would become part of the ancient Roman highway system or trade routes, sometimes called the Imperial Highway. Now, when you think about trade routes today, you're thinking tractor trailers and trains and planes and sh cargo ships and all that kind of stuff. That wasn't the way back then. Trading goods was slow and methodical, and you would transport the goods. And here's what would happen. If you were down south of Israel in Egypt or northern Africa, you would cut through Israel on this road to go on your way to Asia, to Mesopotamia, to Greece, to Italy, all the different parts of the world where you wanted to trade your goods. And people would go back and forth on this road. Where does this road cut through? Capernaum. This was a trading town. This was a border town. This was a trade route town, which meant that literally people from all over the world would travel slowly back and forth to the exact place where Jesus was teaching this lesson. This particular part of ancient Israel was an area of trade, which means these people would have seen people from everywhere. They would have talked to people from everywhere if they were in the trading business. This is very different than where I grew up. Where I grew up, everyone was the same. You never saw anyone not the same. There were no trade routes, just factory workers and farmers. Everybody looked the same. They dressed the same. They talked the same. They thought the same. Everything was the same. So when I was 18 and came to Boston for the first time, I did not know what to do. The whole world was here. A global center of commerce and trade. Everybody from everywhere and every language was here. Now, Capernaum wasn't quite that extreme. Um, people weren't just living from all over the place. But it was a place where people came through. And the people that Jesus was talking to in this story, in this illustration, honestly despised those other people. They despised the foreigners. They certainly had no interest in establishing a relationship with them. Take their money and go. Or, or of being particularly hospitable to them. Because they weren't one of God's chosen people. Turns out they were wrong about that. Jesus is saying to these people, his own people, that in his kingdom, all kinds of people are going to be drawn into his kingdom. They will not be exclusive communities of Jewish elites or pure bloods, but that his message would appeal and attract people from the entire planet, but from every tribe and every nation. In Revelation chapter 5, it says, They sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nations. The message of Jesus is international. That's why we put it in our name, East Coast International Church. That's not because we want to be globally uh, 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 franchised or something. It's because the message here, we are an international community. We want to be an international church. Uh, yeah. So, the message is for all. In verse 48, it says this, When the net was full, they dragged it up onto the shore, sat down, and sorted the good fish into the crates, but threw the bad ones away. Jesus is using this very familiar fishing metaphor illustration to help people understand all kinds of fish, people, are going to be part of his kingdom. But just because you're a tilapia or a mackerel doesn't automatically get you in. The bad ones will get tossed out. What, mean, what this means is your ethnicity isn't a ticket into God's kingdom. Your your. your Family heritage isn't what enters you into God's kingdom. 
Your wealth doesn't buy you into God's kingdom. Your difficult story of oppression and injustice and suffering is simply not enough to get in. One thing alone, your belief in Christ. Your decision to authentically choose Jesus and follow him in his kingdom is the exclusive and only way into his kingdom. Now, remember who's, who he's telling this to. A group of people that very much thought their spiritual heritage and their ethnicity made them part of God's kingdom. That's a radical shift in understanding. Many years ago when Kyla was in elementary school, we were walking in the Lynn Woods and we're just talking and she goes, Dad, I, I was kind of born a Christian. Well, I said, no, Kyla. I, I actually said it much more aggressively than that. Like, no, 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 no. You were not born a Christian, Kyla. You were not born a Christian. You were born a wicked hearted sinner. tough living with me, I know, but <laughs> you are only a follower of Christ because you choose to be a follower of Christ, yeah. not because it's your spiritual ethnicity. Jesus opened the doors of the kingdom wide open for everyone, but you got to choose whether you're going to be part of his kingdom or not, as the worship team comes up. Here, Jesus is talking to his people. He's laying all on the line. He stands in front. He's warning them of impending danger, warning of the improper condition of their hearts and their misunderstandings of the kingdom, warning of the fact that they desperately need to be rescued even though they don't think they need to be. It's like that old story about a man who fell off a cliff that managed to grab a tree limb on the way down. And the following conversation ensued. He's like, is anybody up there? I am here. I am the Lord. Do you believe me? Yes, Lord, I believe. I really believe, but I can't hang on much longer. That's all right. If you really believe, you have nothing to worry about. I will save you. Just let go of the branch. A moment of pause. Then the old man says, is anyone else up there? That is the way that we are as humans. We instinctively seem to understand and know we need God's kingdom but when push comes to shove, it can be difficult to trust God in these moments. And that's, that's really the point today. To understand Jesus' call to trust him and his leadership inside of his kingdom. That his kingdom is going to be different and that we're invited in and that he will be our leader. Why don't you stand with me as we close? So today, that's, that's the opportunity to respond. Where are you at in trusting God? Where are you at in trusting the call of Jesus to follow him? To let him be your forgiver. To let him be your leader. To let his kingdom be the kingdom that you reside within in every aspect of your life. The altars are open. Let's spend some time responding and praying today as the worship team leads us.